Today, budget bribes to nowhere. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Is it worth even talking about the budget, asked myself today as I prepared my daily show. After all, there are millions of articles and comments wall to wall across all channels and social media. Now, I chose to eventually put some thoughts together. The conversation actually did a pretty good job of summarising the major cuts and new spending the former in red and the latter in blue. $3 billion in the next six months to cut the fuel excise from 44.2 to 21.1 cents per litre from March the 30th for six months. Of course, that's going to disappear again. There was $1.5 billion this year for a $250 one-off tax-exempt cost of living payment in April for pensioners and concession card holders just conveniently before the election. There was $4.1 billion over the next two years to extend and increase the low and middle income tax offset, the LMITO, for this tax year up to $1,500 for individuals and $3,000 for couples. There was $1.1 billion for a woman's safety package over the next four years, including programs to help women suffering family, domestic or sexual violence an early intervention campaign aimed at boys and young men, and national counselling services. Then there was $2.4 billion over the next five years to add new pharmaceutical benefit scheme items, including drugs targeting various cancers, cystic fibrosis, COVID treatments, and other chronic or terminal illnesses. And a further $525.3 million to reduce the PBS safety net threshold from 1 July 2022. And there was $9.9 billion, of which $589 million in the next four years, to double the size of the Australian Signals Directorate and increase cyber defence and attack capabilities within the next 10 years. There was $2.4 billion in total by the end of June to provide rats to concessional cardholders, GPs, Aboriginal community health centres and remote communities. And there was $468.3 million over the next five years to implement recommendations from the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. $2.7 billion in savings from unused fuel credits, thanks to the six-month cut in the excise. $2.1 billion in additional receipts over the next four years, which were expected from taxes caught by ATO's Tax Avoidance Task Force, $115 million saved over the next four years by reallocating 10,000 partner visas to the skilled visa stream from July 1, 2022, $150 million in savings from the Consolidated Paid Parental Leave Scheme, which will fund the extension to the program to a shared 20 weeks for both partners. And overall, Westpac summarised as... as a budget deficit profile which has been revised lower, reflecting the windfall from a stronger economy and after incorporating the cost of new spending initiatives. The cumulative deficit for the four years 21-22 to 24-25 is reduced to $261.4 billion, down from $340 billion in MAIFO, that was in December. That's an improvement of $78.6 billion. The budget deficit peaked in 2021 at $134 billion. That represented 6.5% of GDP. And for the current year 21-22, their deficit is now expected to be $79.8 billion. That's an improvement of $19.4 billion compared with MAIFO. The deficit is little changed in 22-23 at $78 billion, just a $20.9 billion improvement. And then it moderates to $56.5 billion in 2324 and $47.1 billion in 2425, which is a $10 billion improvement. And that represents 1.9% of GDP. But of course, it's all in fairyland because it's way out in the future. The stronger economy delivers a budget windfall of $114 billion across the four years to 24-25, centred on $123 billion increase in revenue. Payments are somewhat higher, 
increasing by $9.2 billion, higher inflation and wages growth as to the cost of outlays. And about 70% of the windfall has been directed to reduce deficit and debt. The government unveiled $35.4 billion in new policy measures since MAIFO, with expenditures up by $26.9 billion and revenue down by $8.5 billion. And new policies represent about 1.5% of GDP spread across the four years. Alternatively, including the 24-25 year, the figure over five years is 1.7% of GDP. Initiatives are focused on the remaining months of 21-22 financial year, $8.9 billion or 0.4% of GDP, and 22-23 when it's $17.25 billion or 0.75% of GDP. Thereafter, new policy is worth just $4.7 billion a year or 0.2% of GDP. The net debt profile has been marked materially lower, reflecting the fiscal consolidation achieved in the budget. In my IFO, net debt was expected to lift from 28.6% of GDP in 2021, rising to 374 of GDP in 24-25. The 24-25 forecast has been cut to 33.1% of GDP, representing the peak. The peak in gross debt has been lowered, therefore, and brought forward. And the forecast peak is now 44.9% of GDP in June 2025, when in MAIFO it was 50.3% of GDP out in 2829. Note, the recent increase in market yields has resulted in an assumed weighted average cost of borrowing of around 2.2% for future issuance of Treasury bonds over the full estimates, compared with around 1.7% at MAIFO. The yield curve assumptions underpinning the 21-22 MAIFO and the 22-23 budget shows a rise of around 0.5% on average, which I suspect understates the true likely costs of forward funds. And it's also interesting to note the average tenor of nominal issuance has also fallen. So what do we make of all of this? Well, The Guardian put it like this. The opening flourishes of Josh Frydenberg's budget night speech certainly conveys the gravity of our times. Tonight, as we gather, war rages in Europe, the Treasurer told Parliament. The global pandemic is not over. Devastating floods have battered our communities. We live in uncertain times. Well, indeed, we do. But if we move from Frydenberg's rhetoric to content, we discover this budget isn't a serious plan for the future crafted by serious people in serious times. It's a plan for the next few months. This is a budget with one central objective, the re-election of the Morrison government in May. With wages stagnant and consumer prices on the march, the coalition's primary pre-election gift to voters is cash for Australia's low and middle income earners. As well as cash, the government will cut the fuel excise in half in the hope a price cut at the Bowser isn't swallowed up immediately by another adverse shift in the global oil prices or an interest rate rise between now and September, when the excise is supposed to revert to its full rate. This temporary assistance assumes there is some future benign political universe where either the current government or a newly elected Labour one can give Australians relief at the petrol pump, then take it away without incurring massive political pain, which has to be the working definition of the triumph of hope over experience. Let's believe the fuel excise reversion when we see it. And the costs of, please like me, more than $8 billion over the next two years. The Treasurer and the Finance Minister will say the following in their defence. Most of the pre-election cash splash in this budget washes through. The spending isn't baked in, and much of the revenue uplift from Australia's burgeoning post-pandemic economic recovery has been banked rather than spent. Now, both of those observations are true, but also true is had the Coalition done nothing in this budget to ease escalating cost of living pressures, they would have been belted politically. The government insists its cash splash won't feed inflationary pressures, which is obviously a significant risk to manage. But a pre-election handout north of $8 billion is still a hefty price tag, however you look at it, however you measure it. 
And speaking of hefty price tags, this budget also finally squares the accounts between Scott Morrison, a Prime Minister who last year needed to land a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050, and Barnaby Joyce, a Nationals leader who wasn't inclined to sign up unless the terms were favourable. For graciously declining to humiliate Morrison at the Glasgow Climate Summit last year, Joyce has been rewarded with transformational investments, read many, many billions of dollars, for dams, roads and in regional communications infrastructure. Thank You Barnaby includes about $3 billion for inland rail, as well as $7.1 billion over 11 years to turbocharge the economies of four regional hubs across Australia. It's probably a coincidence, yes, that is irony, that these hubs are located in the Northern Territory, two marginal seats there, North and Central Queensland, Labor has an eye particularly on the electorate of Flynn, the Hunter in New South Wales, where the Nationals would very much like to snatch a seat from Labor, and the Pilbara in Western Australia. This regional spend is north of $20 billion over the medium term. I think the technical term for that is happy days on the Wombat Trail, she said. Given that this budget is very obviously political, and in coalition terms measurably transactional, Frydenberg and Morrison will insist they are about more than surviving an election contest. And I feel certain Exhibit A for future focus will be the national security spend, the magnificently renamed Red Spice, which is, to quote the Treasurer, a $9.9 billion investment in Australia's offensive and defensive cyber capabilities and the biggest ever investment in Australia's cyber preparedness. The government says this initiative is all about meeting the challenges associated with the darkening geostrategic environment, which is very obviously a serious problem. But take a moment to read the fine print. You'll discover the investment to deal with this serious problem is loaded largely outside the forward estimates. The budget papers also makes it clear the expense will be partially offset from the Defence Integrated Investment Program. In net terms, the outlay on Red Spice over the next four years is actually $588.7 million, not $9.9 billion. And do remember that over the coming weeks, when Peter Dutton breaks out his loud hailer and throws down tests of patriotism out on the hustings. And speaking of loud hailers, the 2022 election contest is now in sight. It could be days away, it could be a couple of weeks away, but it is close enough now to be real. And given that there is palpable disenchantment out in Voterland, and given that the Prime Minister is working around the clock to convince people to stick with the devil they know in uncertain times. So that's the politics. But what of the structural finance issues that we actually face? Well, Peter Martin in the conversation had a take on that. So good and so unexpected has been Australia's economic improvement over the past three years, it has wiped out one third of the projected 2022-23 budget deficit, or it would have had the government not decided to give away almost half, actually 45% of the windfall. That's one way of looking at the difference between the projections in the December budget update and those presented three months later in Tuesday's March budget. In December, the deficit for the coming financial year was estimated to be $98.9 billion. Three months later, the budget paper says it would have been $38 billion lower were it not for an extra $17.2 billion of spending and tax measures taken since the update and in the budget. The measures leaves the 22-23 budget deficit at $78 billion, something set to shrink to $43 billion over the following three years, but with no help from savings in this budget. The budget measures expand the deficit in each of the five years for which the government provides projections by $30.4 billion in total. Working the other way, improved economic circumstances shrinks the deficit by $114.6 billion. It's a convenient way to examine the projections, but it's unfair. Most of the improvement due to economic circumstances is the government's own work. An astonishing $98.5 billion of the $114.6 billion improvement is because Australia's extraordinary and unexpected success in driving unemployment down to a near 50-year low with a further improvement forecast in the budget. It is helping the budget in two ways. 
the government is spending much less than expected on job seeker and youth allowance and is taking in much more than expected an income tax from people it hadn't expected to be in work. It's what former finance minister Matthias Cormann insisted would happen in 2020 when the first Covid budget threw the switch to massive spending. By throwing everything it could at keeping people in work through programmes such as JobKeeper, the government would grow the economy and grow tax revenues to push down the resulting government debt as a proportion of GDP. And the budget papers show it's happening. A year ago, net debt was expected to peak at 40.9% of GDP in mid-2025 before sliding as the economy grew. Now it's expected to peak earlier at 33.1% of GDP. Net interest payments are expected to peak at a very small 0.9% of GDP in 2025-26 before slipping to 0.8% of GDP. And there are reasons to think things will turn out better than forecast. Unemployment, now down to 4%, is expected to fall only a little further to 3.75% within months and then stay there before climbing back to 4% in 2026. But that's because Treasury has assumed unemployment can't stay as low as 3.75% without sparking inflation, an assumption it concedes might be wrong, noting Australia has limited recent experience of an unemployment rate lower than 5%. And the Treasury has assumed that the iron ore price at present 134 US dollars a tonne falls back to 55 US dollars a tonne in coming months. And it's assumed the coking coal price falls from 512 US dollars a ton to 130 US dollars a ton, and the thermal coal price from 320 US dollars a ton to 60 US dollars a ton, and the oil price from 114 dollars US a barrel to 100 dollars US a barrel. Every one of those assumptions looks really conservative. Frydenberg admitted as much in the budget press conference saying if commodity prices merely stay put for just the next six months, instead of falling as assumed, the budget will be $30 billion better off. About the only forecast that doesn't look conservative is the one for wages growth. At present, an embarrassingly low 2.3%. The budget forecasts a jump in annual wages growth to 2.75% within months, followed by a jump to 3.25% in 2023 and to 3.5% by June 2025. The forecast conveniently put wages growth back above forecast inflation of 3% in 2223, leaving Australians with only one more year in which the buying power of wages goes backwards. In the budget fine print, Treasury concedes it's not too sure about its forecast of wages growth we haven't seen in a decade. It shares an alternative forecast that uses different assumptions to produce annual wages growth no higher than 2.5%. That's below inflation for a further two years. The cost of living measures are well designed with the exception of the six-month cut in petrol excise that will benefit most the high earners who typically spend the most on petrol. The one-off payment of $250 to Australians on benefits will go to those who do need it. And the one-year boost of $420 to the low and middle income tax offset, bringing it to as much as $1,500, will only be available to Australians earning less than $126,000. And they'll get it after they put their tax return in from July, when they are most likely to need it. And then no more. It's not being continued. So Frydenberg has spent big in 2022, but on the whole, responsibly. The budget forecasts and the unemployment numbers show this his COVID support spending in 20 and 21 has paid dividends. They are forecasts, though, for the true believers. And yet, as Richard Holden again in the conversation notes, Josh Frydenberg's budget is an extraordinary turnaround, but it leaves a $40 billion problem. Josh Frydenberg's fourth budget is a triumph. Net debt is forecast to peak. 33.1% of GDP in 24-25 compared to 40.9% in last year's budget. Net interest payments stay below 1% of GDP. That's a better result than every year from 1984-2000. This is an extraordinary turnaround. Much of it comes in the year to the end of June this year. 
rather than net debt of $729 billion by June 2022, as forecast in last year's budget, it is expected to be $632 billion. This reflects a stronger economy. Unemployment is lower, so welfare payments are too. High commodity prices have helped the budget bottom line, but so too have the tax receipts from increased employment and consumer spending. At the start of the coronavirus pandemic in 2020, the government outlined a clear fiscal strategy, spend big to support the economy and shrink away the debt involved through high economic growth. And it worked. Australian GDP is 3.4% higher than its pre-pandemic state. Only the US at 3.2% is close to that performance among the world's seven largest economies. France is up just 0.9%, Canada up 0.1%, while Germany, Japan and the United Kingdom and Italy have all shrunk. Amid this good news is a lingering concern. By 25-26, the budget deficit is still estimated to be 1.6% of GDP. That's a $43.1 billion gap between government revenues and expenses. And it's a reminder that while two governments, one Liberal and one Labour, have steered the nation through the global financial crisis and the coronavirus pandemic, they have not repaired our structural deficit. The next government, whichever party it is, faces a difficult task. It needs to close the $40 billion structural gap without a turn to austerity that would damage the economic growth engine that's put us in this enviable position. It's something of a high-wire act, and it's the litmus test of good economic management. It's not hard to see why. Defence spending will grow from $35.8 billion this year to $44.5 billion by 2526. And given the global security outlook, it could easily go higher. And spending on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the NDIS, will grow from $30.8 billion this year to $46.1 billion over the same time frame. That's growth of 10.6% per annum. In fact, by 2023, the NDIS is forecast to represent more than $70 billion in government spending. That spending is life-changing for the half a million Australians, but those figures tell us such spending is only sustainable with a strong economy. If unemployment doesn't stay low and economic growth comparatively high, then spending growth in areas like the NDIS and defence will become unsustainable. And one hotly anticipated measure in the budget is a 50% cut in the fuel excise from 44.2 cents to 21.1 cents per litre for six months. Let's be clear, this is great politics. The Treasurer said in his speech, whether you're dropping the kids at school, driving to and from work, or visiting friends and family, it will cost less. This is a beautiful rendition of the time on the political tradition of feeling the voters' pain. And in one way, this makes perfect economic sense too. Why should households bear the risk of petrol prices bouncing around based on global conflict and decisions by the OPEC cartel? As the ACCC has demonstrated, prices at the pump basically move one for one, with the Singapore price of the Mogas 95 unleaded petrol sold to Australia. By setting the fuel excise lower when oil prices are high, and higher when oil prices are low, the government is acting like a big social insurance company. That's part of their job. See Medicare, NDIS, unemployment benefits. But there's a wrinkle to this. According to figures from the Bureau of Statistics Household Expenditure Survey, the bottom fifth of households by income spend around $27 a week, or 3.5% of their income on petrol. By contrast, the top fifth of households spend $42 a week, or 1.8% of their income on petrol. So a per litre cut in petrol benefits higher income households more in dollar terms. And it also doesn't discourage people from driving less. It would be more progressive and better for the environment to just give all households a flat rebate. And more broadly, what about the future? Why no focus on powering up local manufacturing, dealing with the black holes of childcare costs and aged care costs, as well as hospital funding and healthcare, and by the way, dentistry too, overall? So this is as I said in the title, a set of budget bribes to nowhere. But it does not touch the sides 
in terms of addressing the structural issues our economy faces. To be clear, there is an argument for governments to spend big on strategic programmes to transform the economy. But when we borrow just for short-term political wins, I have a problem. And by the way, my other problem, though, is that I'm not sure Labour is any better. Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultants standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high. Price discovery and price transparency are hard to find. And then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience, knowledge and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.